from grabbing hands, inappropriate late night phone calls, aggressive sexual propositioning, to even worse, physical assault and threats. This is the long list of allegations belonging to once powerful political pundit, author and top political journalist, Mark Halperin. I'm Robin Huang, and I'm here today with Emily Labert and Sonia Singh. Hi, ladies. Hi, Robin. Hi, thanks for having us. Today, we are going to discuss Halpern and how his misconduct broke via CNN in October 2017 with the aid of five anonymous sources. So Halpern was one of many high-profile media figures who fell from power over sexual misconduct allegations made during the height of the Me Too movement. He was subsequently let go by NBC Networks and from contracts for Showtime HBO. He did issue a public statement noting that he had mistreated women in his past and pursued relationships with women he had worked with, but he denied the more serious harassment claims, including physical assaults and threats. So one of the original five, uh, Laura Satrakian, did go on record after the original story broke, um, along with another uh, three women, so Eleanor McManus in a CNN op-ed, Diana May to the Washington Post and Emily Miller um, over Twitter. Uh, they all went public with their own stories after the first story broke. And through these stories, we learned it was an open secret never to be alone with Halpern. So most women in the newsroom knew him as creepy, but there was no known or on-record formal complaints um, ever filed to upper management or HR during Halpern's time in the role. So let's begin the discussion, ladies, with whether you think that group anonymity was a necessity in making his behavior known and just to even break the story and get someone like Satrakian to go on record. I think that anonymity allowed this story to be told in the first place. Halperin, as you mentioned, is this huge, powerful figure in media and politics. And those are two incredibly competitive fields. Young women, especially, are often placed in situations with men like Halperin where they're exposed to this kind of behavior. And many of them cite in the report that they were embarrassed about what happened, that they were embarrassed that they never reported it, but also that to this day, Halperin still yields the same or a similar amount of power and that they felt that there might be repercussions or blowback. So in order to protect them, we need to grant them anonymity. And I think that we can assume that the story might not have come to light without that. Absolutely, Emily. Too often, people with stories of sexual misconduct or assault uh, already feel isolated and alone. And to subject them to further questioning may discourage people from coming forward. That's been the case for too long. So granting anonymity here was really key. Yeah, and and with sexual assault victims, um, we need to acknowledge and recognize that as they are telling their stories to reporters, they're reliving this trauma. Mm -hmm. It's a highly sensitive, sensitive topic. And by granting them anonymity, you know, as journalists, we're also protecting them from the masses, from Mm -hmm. what people might say, from whether or not people believe them. Mm -hmm. And to allow it not to follow them for years if they don't want that to be the first thing that comes up when people Google their name, when they go interview for a new job, you know, like you said, it's, there's, there's a lot attached to it. Yeah, and I will say just to kind of counter, Halperin actually uses anonymity in his apology as a way to discount the stories and to deny the claims. But he also says that he can't really refute the claims because he doesn't know who made them. So we mentioned and talk a lot about fear and repercussions. And with sexual harassment reporting, sometimes this can result in death threats, slander, mistreatment, and a myriad of other consequences, you know, happening just by opening up and talking about, you know, your experience as a victim. So let's talk about now, you know, whether these women suffered any consequences as a result of this story. Most of the Twitter traffic focused on applauding women for coming out publicly and for breaking the story during the height of the Me Too era, which was an especially brave time for women to band together and come forward. So not not that we saw at the time, but uh, this is an experience that's still difficult no matter no matter what the public response is. It's still something that each woman in the story has to carry. I mean, we obviously cannot confirm what has become of the anonymous sources, but it looks like both Satrakian and McManus um, have become respected leaders in their fields. Um, They're heads of prominent media firms. Um, Their reputations were not ruined by coming out, and they were generally applauded for telling their story. 
do you both think that the story was in depth uh, without the anonymous woman being named or did anonymity undermine the credibility of the reporting in any sort of way? Yes. I definitely think the CNN reporting was in depth and that is due to a strength in numbers. We see a kind of metaphorical unification of these five women who were the original anonymous sources in the reporting. Um, and they all had similar stories. They all, except for one, worked in the ABC News environment. Um, we see kind of similar trends and narratives play out within their allegations. And we can assume, due to the reporting, that these women didn't share their stories with each other prior to the allegations coming to light in CNN's report. While we don't have names listed here, we do have the kind of trust of the journalists. These people were in the journalistic field. Ultimately, as we've discussed in this class, journalists are the truth tellers. And so we get that extra kind of credibility, even without their name. They were still aspiring journalists and, and we hope that they would be telling the truth. Yeah, absolutely, Emily. And in terms of both corroboration in numbers and corroboration in detail, we also see this reporting approach in other Me Too stories at the time, uh, like Jody Cantor and Megan Toohey's first uh, New York Times piece about the allegations against Harvey Weinstein. Uh, they were comparing stories told by women who worked in different Miramax offices in different locations, and in some cases at different times. Uh, yet some of the same details kept surfacing, these unusual patterns solidified over time. And it's hard to deny the persuasiveness of that reporting. So Laura Satrakian came out, out of the original Anonymous Five. She might have came up without the anonymous sources around her, especially if she was still feeling some fear. Um, from interviews uh, noted after the fact, her family definitely felt fear with her coming out. But if she had come out alone, do you think her story would have seemed as strong? Do you think Oliver Darcy could have broken the story without relying on anonymous sources, especially if Halperin could have denied it all at the get-go? No, I, I don't think that Darcy could have broken the story without anonymous sources. Even, you know, Satrakian, as you mentioned, said that she eventually felt comfortable putting her name to the, the conflict and to the allegation. Um, but it wouldn't have showcased the same kind of impact. You know, one woman is very different from five different women across multiple decades making similar allegations. It paints a really different story. So while we might have had um, Satrakian come forward to Darcy within the reporting, it just, I don't think that the change would have been as huge because this really rippled throughout the media industry and was then multiplied by the other sources that jumped on board. With prominent Me Too cases, anonymity has helped to drive critical change. Um, do you ladies think that there has been enough impactful change? And what can we do better as journalists with reporting these types of stories going forward? It's so hard to measure the impactful change and whether it's been enough, Robin. It's a great point. Um, we've seen powerful men accused of misconduct in news lose their positions from Halperin to Charlie Rose to Matt Lauer. And visible consequences are important. And hopefully removing them from positions of power shows others that the days of open secret culture are over, we hope. <laughs> Um, but what about when it's not an open secret, it's just a secret, and when one woman thinks she's the only one with a story? Um, as women in media or entering media, uh, what, what do you guys think? Um, I know I still probably wouldn't be comfortable going to HR, but thanks to reporting like this, I think there's some hope that action will now be taken against a perpetrator, and uh, hopefully that inspires more women to be able to confide in someone, and that can lead to discovering that you're not alone. Yeah, I mean, I think so. something that Suprakian said in her op-ed is that as journalists, we ask people to confide in us every day to put themselves at risk through the information they share. And we need to show the same bravery. So there is still work to be done in the media industry. We see different kinds of reckonings happening every day, whether that's, you know, bullying behavior or, um, you know, racism within the newsroom. There is still work to be done. And Satrakian is kind of arguing that if we are asking sources within other industries to be brave and share their stories, then we are expected to be held to the same standard and we need to share our voices as well. 
Emily, Sonia, unfortunately we are running out of time. I want to thank you both, though, for carving out time in your busy schedules to discuss this really important subject, and I look forward to the next time we can get together for another panel. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in. Have a good night.